Chapter Thirty Three of Nature and Art. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Ray Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Nature and Art by Elizabeth Ichabald. Chapter Thirty Three. Before Henry could receive a reply to his letter, the fleet in which he sailed put to sea. By his absence, not only Rebecca was deprived of the friend she loved, but poor Agnes lost a kind and compassionate adviser. The loss of her parents, too, she had to mourn, for they both sickened and both died in a short time after, and now wholly friendless in her little exile, where she could only hope for toleration not being known she was contending with suspicion rebuffs disappointments and various other ills which might have made the more rigorous of her anfield persecutors feel compassion for her could they have witnessed the throbs of her heart and all the deep wounds there imprinted still there are few persons whom providence afflicts beyond the limits of all consolation few cast so low as not to feel pride on certain occasions and agnes felt a comfort and a dignity in the thought that she had both a mind and a body capable of sustaining every hardship which her destiny might inflict rather than submit to the disgrace of soliciting william's charity a second time this determination was put to a variety of trials in vain she offered herself to the strangers of the village in which she was accidentally cast as a servant her child her dejected looks her broken sentences a wildness in her eye a kind of bold despair which at times overspread her features her imperfect story who and what she was prejudiced all those to whom she applied and after thus travelling to several small towns and hamlets the only employer she could obtain was a farmer and the only employment to tend and feed his cattle while his men were in the harvest tilling the ground or at some other labor which required at the time particular expedition though agnes was born of peasants yet having been the only child of industrious parents she had been nursed with a tenderness and delicacy ill suited to her present occupation but she endured it with patience and the most laborious part would have seemed light could she have dismissed the reflection what it was that had reduced her to such a state soon her tender hands became hard and rough her fair skin burnt and yellow so that when on a sunday she has looked in the glass she has started back as if it were some other face she saw instead of her own but this loss of beauty gave her no regret while william did not see her it was indifferent to her whether she were beautiful or hideous on the features of her child only she now looked with joy there she fancied she saw william at every glance and in the fond imagination felt at times every happiness short of seeing him by herding with brute creation she and her child were allowed to live together and this was a state she preferred to the society of human creatures who would have separated her from what she loved so tenderly anxious to retain a service in which she possessed such a blessing care and attention to her humble office caused her master to prolong her stay through all the winter then during the spring she tended his yeaning sheep in the summer watched them as they grazed and thus season after season passed till her young son could afford her assistance in her daily work he now could charm her with his conversation as well as with his looks 
a thousand times in the transports of parental love she has pressed him to her bosom and thought with an agony of horror upon her criminal her mad intent to destroy what was now so dear so necessary to her existence still the boy grew up more and more like his father in one resemblance alone he failed he loved agnes with an affection totally distinct from the pitiful and childish gratification of his own self-love he never would quit her side for all the tempting offers of toys or money never would eat of rarities given to him till agnes took a part never crossed her will however contradictory to his own never saw her smile that he did not laugh nor did she ever weep but he wept too end of chapter thirty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number thirty four of nature and art this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c nature and art by elizabeth ichabald chapter thirty four from the mean subject of oxen sheep and peasants we return to personages i e persons of rank and fortune the bishop who was introduced in the foregoing pages but who has occupied a very small space there is now mentioned again merely that the reader may know he is at present in the same state as his writings dying and that his friend the dean is talked of as the most likely successor to his dignified office the dean most assuredly had a strong friendship for the bishop and now most assuredly wishes him to recover and yet when he reflected on the success of his pamphlet a few years past and of many which he had written since on the very same subject he could not but think that he had more righteous pretensions to fill the vacant seat of his much beloved and reverend friend should fate ordain it to be vacated than any other man and he knew that it would not take one moment from that friend's remaining life should he exert himself with all due management to obtain the elevated station when be should he no more in presupposing the death of a friend the dean like many other virtuous men always suppose him going to a better place with perfect resignation therefore he waited whatever change might happen to the bishop ready to receive him with open arms if he recovered or equally ready in the case of his dissolution to receive his dignities lady clementina displayed her sensibility and feeling for the sick prelate by the extravagance of hysteric fits except at those times when she talked seriously with her husband upon the injustice which she thought would be done to him and to his many pamphlets and sermons if he did not immediately rise to episcopal honor surely dean said she should you be disappointed upon this occasion you will write no more books for the good of your country yes i will he replied but the next book i write for the good of my country shall be very different nay the reverse of those i have already written how dean would you show yourself changed no but i will show that my country is changed what since you produced your last work only six weeks ago great changes may occur in six days replied the dean with a threatening accent and if i find things have taken a new and improper turn i will be the first to expose it 
but before you act in this manner my dear surely you will wait i will wait until the sea is disposed of to another said he he did wait the bishop died the dean was promoted to the see of and wrote a folio on the prosperity of our happy country End of chapter 34 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 35 of Nature and Art This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c nature and art by elizabeth ichabald chapter thirty five while the bishop and his son were sailing before prosperous gales on the ocean of life young henry was contending with adverse winds and many other perils on the watery ocean yet still his distresses and dangers were less than those with which agnes had to encounter upon land the sea threatens an untimely death the shore menaces calamities from which death is a refuge the affections she had already experienced could just admit of aggravation the addition occurred had the good farmer who made her the companion of his flocks and herds lived till now till now she might have been secure from the annoyance of humankind but thrown once more upon society she was unfit to sustain the conflict of decorum against depravity her master her patron her preserver was dead and hardly as she had earned the pittance she received from him she found that it surpassed her power to obtain the like again her doubtful character her capricious mind her unmethodical manners were still badly suited to the nice precision of a country housewife and as the prudent mistress of a family sneered at her pretensions she in turn scorned the narrow-minded mistress of a family in her inquiries how to gain her bread free from the cutting reproaches of discretion she was informed that london was the only private corner where guilt could be secreted undisturbed and the only public place where in open day it might triumphantly stalk attended by a chain of audacious admirers there was a charm to the ear of agnes in the name of london which thrilled through her soul william lived in london and she thought that while she retired to some dark cellar with her offences he probably would ride in state with his and she at humble distance might sometimes catch a glance at him as difficult as to eradicate insanity from a mind once possessed so difficult it is to erase from the lover's breast the deep impression of a real affection coercion may prevail for a short interval still love will rage again not all the ignominy which agnes experienced in the place where she now was without a home not the hunger which she at times suffered even at times saw her child endure not every inducement for going to london or motive for quitting her present desolate station had the weight to affect her choice so much as in london she should live nearer william in the present spot she could never hope to see him again but there she might chance to pass him in the streets she might pass his house every day unobserved might inquire about him of his inferior neighbours who would be unsuspicious of the cause of her curiosity for these gratifications she should imbibe new fortitude for these she could bear all hardships where london threatened 
and for these she at length undertook a three weeks journey to that perilous town on foot cheering as she walked along her innocent and wearied companion william in their luxurious dwelling possessed of coffers filled with gold relations friends clients joyful around you delicious viands and rich wines upon your sumptuous board voluptuousness displayed in every apartment of your habitation contemplate for a moment agnes your first love with her son your first and only child walking through frost and snow to london with a foreboding fear on the mother that when arrived they both may perish for the want of a friend but no sooner did agnes find herself within the smoke of the metropolis than the old charm was renewed and scarcely had she refreshed her child at the poor inn at which she stopped than she inquired how far it was to that part of the town where william she knew resided she received for answer about two miles upon this information she thought that she would keep in reserve till some new sorrow befell her the consolation of passing his door perchance of seeing him which must ever be an alleviation of her grief it was not long before she had occasion for more substantial comfort soon she found she was not likely to obtain a service here more than in the country some objected that she could not make caps and gowns some that she could not preserve and pickle some that she was too young some that she was too pretty and all declined accepting her till at last a citizen's wife on condition of her receiving but half the wages usually given took her as a servant of all work in romances and in some plays there are scenes of dark and unwholesome minds wherein the laborer works during the brightest day by the aid of artificial light there are in london kitchens equally dismal though not quite so much exposed to damp and nauseous vapors in one of these underground hidden from the cheerful light of the sun poor agnes was doomed to toil from morning till night subjected to the command of a dissatisfied mistress who not estimating as she ought the misery incurred by serving her constantly threatened her servants with a dismission at which the unthinking wretches would tremble merely from the sound of the words for to have reflected to have considered what their purport was to be released from the dungeon relieved from continual upbraidings and vile drudgery must have been a subject of rejoicing and yet because these good tidings were delivered as a menace custom had made the hearer fearful of the consequence so death being described to children as a disaster even poverty and shame will start from it with a fright whereas had it been pictured with its benign aspect it would have been feared but by few and many many would welcome it with gladness all the care of agnes to please her fear of offending her toilsome days her patience her submission could not prevail on her she served to retain her one hour after by chance she heard that she was the mother of a child that she wished it should be kept a secret and that she stole out now and then to visit him agnes with swimming eyes and an almost breaking heart left a place where to have lived one hour would have plunged any fine lady in the deepest grief end of chapter thirty five recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 36 of Nature and Art. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Nature and Art by Elizabeth Ichabald. Chapter 36 Agnes was driven from service to service. Her deficiency in the knowledge of a mere drudge, or her lost character, pursued her wherever she went. At length, becoming wholly destitute, she gladly accepted a place where the latter misfortune was not of the least impediment. In one of these habitations, where continual misery is dressed in continuous smiles, where extreme of poverty is concealed by extreme of finery, where wine dispenses mirth only by dispensing forgetfulness, and where female beauty is so cheap, so complying that, while it inveigles, it disgusts the man of pleasure, in one of those houses, to attend upon its wretched inhabitants, Agnes was hired. Her feelings of rectitude submitted to those of hunger. Her principles of virtue, which the loss of virtue had not destroyed, received a shock when she engaged to be the abettor of vice, from which her delicacy, morality, and religion shrunk. But persons of honor and of reputation would not employ her. Was she then to perish? That, perhaps, was easy to resolve. But she had a child to leave behind. A child from whom to part for a day was a torment. Yet before she submitted to a situation which filled her mind with a kind of loathing horror, often she paced up and down the street in which William lived, looking wistfully at his house, and sometimes, lost to all her finer feelings of independent pride, thought of sending a short petition to him, but, at the idea of repulse, and of that frowning brow which she knew William could dart on her petition, she preferred death, or the most degrading life to the trial. It was long since the misfortune and dishonor had made her callous to the good or ill opinion of all the world except his, and the fear of drawing upon her his increased contempt was still at the crisis of applying so powerful that she found she dared not hazard a reproof from him even in the person of his father whose rigour she had already more than once experienced in the frequent harsh messages conveyed to her with the poor stipton for her boy awed by the rigid and pious character of the new bishop the growing reputation and rising honours of his son she mistook the appearance of moral excellence for moral excellence itself and felt her own unworthiness even to become the supplicant of those great men day after day she watched those parts of the town through which william's chariot was accustomed to drive but to see the carriage was all to which she aspired a feeling not to be described forced her to cast her eyes upon the earth as it drew near to her and when it had passed she beat her breast and wept that she had not seen him impressed with the superiority of others and her own abject and disgustful state she cried let me herd with those who wouldn't despise me let me only see faces whereon i can look without confusion and terror let me associate with wretches like myself rather than force my shame before those who are so good they can but scorn and hate me with a mind thus languishing for sympathy in disgrace she entered a servant in the house just now described there disregarding the fatal proverb against evil communications she had not the firmness to be an exception 
to the general rule that pliant disposition which had yielded to the licentious love of william stooped to still baser prostitution in company still more depraved at first she shuddered at those practices she saw at those conversations she heard and blessed herself that poverty not inclination had caused her to be a witness of such profligacy and had condemned her in this vile abode to be a servant rather than in the lower rank of mistress use softened those horrors every day at length self-defence the fear of ridicule and the hope of favour induced her to adopt the very conduct from which her heart revolted in her sorrowful countenance and fading charms there yet remained attraction for many visitors and she now submitted to the mercenary profanations of love more odious as her mind had been subdued by its most captivating most endearing joys while incessant regret whispered to her that she ought to have endured every calamity rather than this she thus questioned her nice sense of wrong why why respect myself since no other respects me why set a value on my own feelings when no one else does degraded in her own judgment she doubted her own understanding when it sometimes told her she had deserved better treatment for she felt herself a fool in comparison with her learned seducer and the rest who despised her and why she continued should i ungratefully persist to condemn women who alone are so kind as to accept me for a companion why refuse conformity to their customs since none of my sex besides will admit me to their society a partaker of virtuous habits in speculation these arguments appeared reasonable and she pursued their dictates but in the practice of the life in which she plunged she proved the fallacy of the system and at times tore her hair with frantic sorrow that she had not continued in the midway of guilt and so preserved some portion of self-approbation to recompense her in a small degree for the total loss of the esteem of all the reputable world but she had gone too far to recede could she now have recalled her innocence even that remnant she brought with her to london experience would have taught her to have given up her child lived apart from him and once more with the brute creation rather than to have mingled with her present society now alas the time for flying was past all prudent choice was over even all reflection was gone for ever or only omitted on compulsion when it imperiously forced its way amidst the scenes of tumultuous mirth or licentious passion of distracted riot shameless effrontery and wild intoxication when it would force its way even through the walls of a brothel end of chapter thirty six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter thirty seven of nature and art this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c nature and art by elizabeth ichabald chapter thirty seven is there a reader so little experienced in the human heart so forgetful of his own as not to feel the possibility of the following fact 
a series of uncommon calamities had been for many years the lot of the elder henry a succession of prosperous events had fallen to the share of his brother william the one was the envy while the other had the compassion of all who thought about them for the last twenty years william had lived in affluence bordering upon splendor his friends his fame his fortune daily increasing while henry throughout that very period had by degrees lost all he loved on earth and was now existing apart from civilized society and yet during those twenty years while william knew one happy moment henry tasted hundreds that the state of mind and not outward circumstances is that nice point on which happiness depends but is a trite remark but that intellectual power should have the force to render a man discontented in extraordinary prosperity such as that of the present bishop or contented in his brother's extreme of adversity requires illustration the first great affliction to henry was his brother's ingratitude but reasoning on the frailty of man's nature and the force of man's temptations he found excuses for william which made him support the treatment he had received with more tranquillity than william's proud mind supported his brother's marriage henry's indulgent disposition made him less angry with william than william was with him the next affliction henry suffered was the loss of his beloved wife that was a grief which time and change of objects gradually alleviated while william's wife was to him a permanent grief her puerile mind her talking vanity her affected virtues soured his domestic comfort and in time he had suffered more painful moments from her society than his brother had experienced even from the death of her he loved in their children indeed william was the happier his son was a pride and pleasure to him while henry never thought upon his without lamenting his loss with bitterest anguish but if the elder brother had in one instance the advantage still henry had a resource to overbalance this article henry as he lay imprisoned in his dungeon and when his punishment being remitted he was again allowed to wander and seek his subsistence where he would in all his tedious walks and solitary resting places during all his lonely days and mournful nights had this resource to console him i never did injury to any one never was harsh severe unkind deceitful i did not merely confine myself to do my neighbor no harm i strove to do him service this was the resource that cheered his sinking heart amid gloomy deserts and a barbarous people lulled him to peaceful slumber in the hut of a savage hunter and in the hearing of a lion's roar at times impressed him with a sense of happiness and made him contemplate with a longing hope the retribution of a future world the bishop with all his comforts had no comfort like this he had his solitary reflections too but they were of a tendency the reverse of these i used my brother ill was a secret thought of most powerful influence it kept him waking upon his safe and commodious bed was sure to recur with every misfortune by which he was threatened to make his fears still stronger and came with individuous stabs upon every successful event to take from him a part of his joy in a word it was conscience which made henry's years pass happier than william's but though comparatively with his brother 
william was the less happy man yet his self-reproach was not of such magnitude for an offence that atrocious nature as to banish from his breast a certain degree of happiness a sensibility to the smiles of fortune nor was henry's self-acquittal of such exquisite kind as to chase away the feeling of his desolate condition as he fished or hunted for his daily dinner many a time in full view of his prey a sudden burst of sorrow at his fate a sudden longing for some dear associate for some friend to share his thoughts for some kind shoulder on which to lean his head for some companion to partake of his repast would make him instantaneously desist from his pursuit cast him on the ground in a fit of anguish till a shower of tears and his conscience came to his relief it was after an exile of more than twenty-three years when on one sultry morning after pleasant dreams during the night henry had waked with more than usual perception of his misery that that sitting upon the beach his wishes and his looks all bent on the sea towards his native land he thought he saw a sail swelling before an unexpected breeze sure i am dreaming still he cried this is the very vessel i last night saw in my sleep oh what cruel mockery that my eyes should so deceive me yet though he doubted he leapt upon his feet in transport held up his hands stretched at their length in a kind of ecstatic joy and as the glorious sight approached was near rushing into the sea to hail and meet it for a while hope and fear kept him in a state bordering on distraction now he saw the ship making for the shore and tears flowed for the grateful prospect now it made for another point and he vented shrieks and groans from the disappointment it was at those moments while hope and fear thus possessed him that the oars of his abode appeared more than ever frightful inevitable afflictions must be borne but that calamity which admits the expectation of relief and then denies it is insupportable after a few minutes passed in dreadful uncertainty which enhanced the wished-for happiness the ship evidently drew near the land a boat was launched from her and while henry now upon his knees wept and prayed fervently for the event a youth sprang from the barge on the strand rushed towards him and falling on his neck then at his feet exclaimed my father oh my father william deem bishop what are your honors what your riches what all your possessions compared to the happiness the transport bestowed by this one sentence on your poor brother henry end of chapter thirty seven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter thirty eight of nature and art this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c nature and art by elizabeth ichabald chapter thirty eight the crosses at land and the perilous events at sea had made it now two years since young henry first took the vow of a man no longer dependent on the will of another to seek his father his fatigues his dangers were well recompensed instead of weeping over a silent grave he had the inexpressible joy to receive a parent's blessing for his labors yet the elder henry through living 
was so changed in person that his son would scarcely have known him in any other than the favorite spot which the younger keeping in memory every incident of his former life knew his father had always chosen for his morning contemplations and where previously to his coming to england he had many a time kept him company it was to that particular corner of the island that the captain of the ship had generously ordered they should steer out of the general route to gratify the filial tenderness he expressed but scarcely had the interview between father and the son taken place than a band of natives whom the appearance of the vessel had called from the woods and hills came to attack the invaders the elder henry had no friend with whom he wished to shake hands at his departure the old negro servant who had assisted in young henry's escape was dead and he experienced the excessive joy of bidding adieu to the place without one regret for all he left behind on the night of that day whose morning had been marked by peculiar sadness at the lowering prospect of many exiled years to come he slept on board an english vessel with englishmen his companions and his son his beloved son who was still more dear to him for that mind which had planned and executed his rescue this son his attentive servant and most affectionate friend though many a year passed and many a rough encounter was destined to the lot of the two henrys before they saw the shores of europe yet to them to live or to die together was happiness enough even young henry for a time asked for no greater blessing but the first glow of filial order over he called to mind rebecca lived in england and every exertion which love founded on the highest reverence and esteem could dictate he employed to expedite a voyage the end of which would be crowned by the sight of her end of chapter thirty eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter thirty nine of nature and art this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c nature and art by elizabeth ichabald chapter thirty nine the contrast of the state of happiness between the two brothers was nearly resembled by that of the two cousins the riches of young william did not render him happy nor did the poverty of young henry doom him to misery his affectionate heart as he had described in his letter to rebecca loved persons rather than things and he would not have exchanged the society of his father nor the prospect of her hand and heart for all the wealth and splendor of which his cousin william was the master he was right young william thought he viewed with contempt henry's inferior state was far less happy than he his marriage had been the very counterpart of his father's and having no child to create affection to his home his study was the only relief from that domestic encumbrance called his wife and though by unremitting application there joined to the influence of the potent relations of the woman he hated he at length arrived at the summit of his ambitious desires still they poorly repaid him for the sacrifice he had made in early life of every tender disposition striding through a list of rapid advancements in the profession of the law at the age of thirty-eight he found himself raised to a preferment 
such as rarely falls to the share of a man of his short experience he found himself invested with a judge's robe and gratified by the exalted office curbed more than ever that aversion which her want of charms or sympathy had produced against the partner of his honours while william had thus been daily rising in fortune's favour poor agnes had been daily sinking deeper and deeper under fortune's frowns till at last she became a midnight wanderer through the streets of london soliciting or rudely demanding money of the passing stranger sometimes haunted by the watch she affrighted fled from street to street from portico to portico and once knowing in her fear which way she hurried she found her trembling knees had sunk and her wearied head was reclined against the stately pillars that guarded william's door at the sudden recollection where she was a swell of passion composed of horror of anger of despair and love gave reanimated strength to her failing limbs and regardless of her pursuer's steps she ran to the centre of the street and looking up to the windows of the mansion cried ah there he sleeps in quiet in peace in ease he does not even dream of me he does not care how the cold pierces or how the people persecute me he does not thank me for all the lavish love i have borne him and his child his heart is so hard he does not even recollect that it was he who brought me to ruin had these miseries common to the unhappy prostitute had been alone the punishment of agnes had her crimes and sufferings ended in distress like this her story had not perhaps been selected for a public recital for it had been no other than the customary history of thousands of her sex but agnes had a destiny yet more fatal unhappy she was endowed with a mind so sensibly alive to every joy and every sorrow to every mark of kindness every token of severity so liable to excess in passion that once perverted there was no degree of error from which it would revolt taught by the conversation of the dissolute poor with whom she now associated or by her own observation on the worldly reward of elevated villainy she began to suspect that dishonesty was only held a sin to secure the property of the rich and that to take from those who did not want by the art of stealing was less guilt than to take from those who did want by the power of the law by false yet seducing opinions such as these her reason estranged from every moral and religious tie her necessities urgent she reluctantly accepted the proposal to mix with a band of practised sharpers and robbers and became an accomplice in negotiating bills forged on a country banker but though ingenious in arguments to excuse the deed before its commission in the act she had ever the dread of some inconvertible statement on the other side of the question intimidated by this apprehension she was the veriest bungler in her vile profession and on the alarm of being detected while every one of her confederates escaped and absconded she alone was seized was arrested for issuing notes they had fabricated and committed to the provincial jail about fifty miles from london where the crime had been perpetrated to take her trial for life or death end of chapter thirty nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c
Chapter Forty of Nature and Art. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Nature and Art by Elizabeth Ichabald. Chapter Forty. The day at length is come on which Agnes shall have a sight of her beloved William. She, who has watched for hours near his door, to procure a glimpse of him going out or returning home, who has walked miles to see his chariot pass, she now will behold him, and he will see her by command of the laws of their country. Those laws, which will deal with rigors towards her, are in this one instance still indulgent the time of the assize at the country town in which she is imprisoned is arrived the prisoners are demanded at the shire hall the jail doors are opened they go in sad procession the trumpet sounds it speaks the arrival of the judge and that judge is william the day previous to her trial agnes had read in the printed calendar of the prisoners his name as a learned justice before whom she was to appear for a moment she forgot her perilous state in the excess of joy which the still unconquerable love she bore to him permitted her to taste even on the brink of the grave after reflection made her check those worldly transports as unfit for the present solemn occasion but alas to her earth and william were so closely united that till she forsook the one she could never cease to think without the contending passions of hope of fear of joy of love of shame and of despair on the other now fear took place of her first immoderate joy she feared that although much changed in person since he had seen her and her real name now added to many an alias yet she feared the same well-known glance of the eye turn of the action or accent of speech might recall her to his remembrance and at that idea shame overcame all her other sensations for she still retained pride in respect to his opinion to wish him not to know agnes was that wretch she felt she was once a ray of hope beamed on her that if he knew her he recognized her he might possibly befriend her cause and life bestowed through william's friendship seemed a precious object but again that rigorous honor she had often heard him boast that firmness to his word of which she had fatal experience taught her to know he would not for any improper compassion any unmanly weakness forfeit his oath of impartial justice in meditations such as these she passed the sleepless night when in the morning she was brought to the bar and her guilty hand held up before the righteous judgment seat of william imagination could not form two figures or two situations more incompatible with the existence of former familiarity than the judge and the culprit and yet these very persons had passed together the most blissful moments that either ever tasted those hours of tender dalliance were now present to her mind his thoughts were more nobly employed in his high office nor could the haggard face hollow eye desponding countenance and meagre person of the poor prisoner once called to his memory though her name was uttered among a list of others which she had assumed his former youthful lovely agnes she heard herself arraigned with trembling limbs and downcast looks and many witnesses had appeared against her before she ventured to lift her eyes up to her awful judge 
She then gave one fearful glance, and discovered William, unpitying but beloved William, in every feature. It was a face she had been used to look on with delight, and a kind of absent smile of gladness now beamed on her poor wan visage. When every witness on the part of the prosecutor had been examined, the judge addressed himself to her. What defense have you to make? It was William spoke to Agnes. The sound was sweet, the voice was mild, was soft, compassionate, encouraging. It almost charmed her to a love of life. Not such a voice as when William last addressed her when he left her undone and pregnant, vowing never to see or speak to her more. She could have hung upon the present words forever. She did not call to mind that this gentleness was the effect of practice, the art of his occupation, which, at times, is but a copy by the unfeeling from his benevolent brethren of the bench. In the present judge, tenderness was not designed for the consolation of the culprit but for the approbation of the auditors there were no spectators agnes by your side when he last parted from you if there had the awful william had been awed to marks of pity stunned with the enchantment of that well-known tongue directed to her she stood like one just petrified all vital power seemed suspended again he put the question and with these additional sentences tenderly and emphatically delivered recollect yourself have you no witnesses no proof in your behalf a dead silence followed these questions he then mildly but forcibly added what have you to say here a flood of tears burst from her eyes which she fixed earnestly upon him as if pleading for mercy while she faintly articulated nothing my lord after a short pause he asked her in the same forcible but benevolent tone have you no one to speak to your character the prisoner answered a second gush of tears followed this reply for she called to mind by whom her character had first been blasted he summed up the evidence and every time he was compelled to press hard upon the proofs against her she shrunk and seemed to stagger with the deathly blow writhed under the weight of his minute justice more than from the prospect of a shameful death the jury consulted but a few minutes the verdict was guilty she heard it with composure but when William placed the fatal velvet on his head and rose to pronounce her sentence, she started with a kind of convulsive motion, retreated a step or two back, and, lifting up her hands with a scream, exclaimed, Oh, not from you! The piercing shriek which accompanied these words prevented their being heard by part of the audience and those who heard them thought little of their meaning more than they expressed her fear of dying serene and dignified as if no such exclamation had been uttered william delivered the fatal speech ending with dead 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 she fainted as he closed the period and was carried back to prison in a swoon while he adjourned the court to go to dinner End of chapter 40 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter number 41 of Nature and Art This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Nature and Art by Elizabeth Ichabald. Chapter 41 If 
unaffected by the scene he had witnessed william sat down to dinner with an appetite let not the reader conceive that the most distant suspicion had struck his mind of his ever having seen much less familiarly known the poor offender whom he had just condemned still this forgetfulness did not proceed from the want of memory for agnes in every peevish or heavy hour passed with his wife he was sure to think of her yet it was self-love rather than love of her that gave rise to these thoughts he felt the lack of female sympathy and tenderness to soften the fatigue of studious labor to soothe a sullen a morose disposition he felt he wanted comfort for himself but never once considered what were the wants of agnes in the chagrin of a barren bed he sometimes thought too even on the child that agnes bore him but whether it were male or female whether a beggar in the streets or dead various and important public occupations forbade him to waste time to inquire yet the poor the widow and the orphan frequently shared william's ostentatious bounty he was the president of many excellent charities gave largely and sometimes instituted benevolent societies for the unhappy for he delighted to load the poor with obligations and the rich with praise there are persons like him who love to do every good but that which their immediate duty requires there are servants who will serve every one more cheerfully than their masters there are men who will distribute money liberally to all except their creditors and there are wives who will love all mankind better than their husbands duty is a familiar word which has little effect upon an ordinary mind and as ordinary minds make a vast majority we have acts of generosity valor self-denial and bounty where smaller pains would constitute greater virtues had william followed the common dictates of charity had he adopted private pity instead of public munificence had he cast an eye at home before he sought abroad for objects of compassion agnes had been preserved from an ignominious death and he had been preserved from remorse the tortures of which he for the first time proved on reading a printed sheet of paper accidentally thrown his way a few days after he had left the town in which he had condemned her to die march the twelfth seventeen ninety the last dying words speech and confession birth parentage and education life character and behavior of agnes primrose who was executed this morning between the hours of ten and twelve pursuant to the sentence passed upon her by the honorable justice nor win agnes primrose was born of honest parents in the village of anfield in the county of william started at the name of the village and county but being led astray by the arts and flattery of seducing men she fell from the paths of virtue and took to bad company which instilled in her young heart all their evil ways and at length brought her to this untimely end so she hopes her death will be a warning to all young persons of her own sex how they listen to the praises and courtship of young men especially of those who are their betters for they only court to deceive but she said agnes freely forgives all persons who have done her injury or given her sorrow from the young man who first won her heart to the jury who found her guilty and the judge who condemned her to death and she acknowledges the justice of her sentence not only in respect of the crime for which she suffers but in regard to many other heinous sins of which she has been guilty more especially that 
of once attempting to commit a murder upon her own helpless child for which guilt she now considers the vengeance of god has overtaken her to which she is patiently resigned and departs in peace and charity with all the world praying the lord to have mercy on her parting soul postscript to the confession so great was this unhappy woman's terror of death and the awful judgment that was to follow that when sentence was pronounced upon her she fell into a swoon from that into convulsions from which she never entirely recovered but was delirious to the time of her execution except that short interval in which she made her confession to the clergyman who attended her she has left one child a youth about sixteen who has never forsaken his mother during all the time of her imprisonment but waited on her with true filial duty and no sooner was her fatal sentence passed than he began to droop and now lies dangerously ill near the prison from which she is released by death during the loss of her senses the said agnes primrose raved continually on this child and asking for pen ink and paper wrote an incoherent petition to the judge recommending the youth to his protection and mercy but notwithstanding this insanity she behaved with composure and resignation when the fatal morning arrived in which she was to be launched into eternity she prayed devoutly during the last hour and seemed to have her whole mind fixed on the world to which she was going a crowd of spectators followed her to the fatal spot most of whom returned weeping at the recollection of the feverency with which she prayed and the impression which her dreadful state seemed to make upon her no sooner had the name of anfield struck william than a thousand reflections and remembrances flashed on his mind to give him full conviction whom it was he had judged and sentenced he recollected the sand remains of agnes such as he once had known her and now he wondered how his thoughts could have been absent from an object so pitiable so worthy of his attention and not to give him every suspicion who she was either from her name or from her person during the whole trial but wonder astonishment horror and every other sensation was absorbed by remorse it wounded it stabbed it rent his hard heart as it would do a tender one it havoced on his firm inflexible mind as it would on a weak and pliant brain spirit of agnes look down and behold all your wrongs revenged william feels remorse end of chapter forty one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty two of nature and art this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c nature and art by elizabeth inchibald chapter forty two a few momentary cessations from the pangs of a guilty conscience were given to william as soon as he had dispatched a messenger to the jail in which agnes had been communed to inquire after the son she had left behind and to give orders that immediate care should be taken of him he likewise charged the messenger to bring back the petition she had addressed to him during her supposed insanity for he now experienced no trivial consolation in the thought that he might possibly have it in his power to grant her a request 
The messenger returned with the written paper, which had been considered by the persons to whom she had entrusted it, as the distracted dictates of an insane mind, but proved to William, beyond doubt, that she was perfectly in her senses. To Lord Chief Justice Norwin. My lord, I am Agnes Primrose, the daughter of John and Hannah Primrose of Anfield. My father and mother live by the hill at the side of the little brook where you used to fish, and so first saw me. Pray, my lord, have mercy on my sorrows. Pity me for the first time, and spare my life. I know I have done wrong. I know it is presumption in me to dare to apply to you, such a wicked and mean wretch as I am. But, my lord, you once condescended to take notice of me, and though I have been very wicked since that time, yet if you would be so merciful as to spare my life, I promise to amend it for the future. But if you think it proper I should die, I will be resigned. But then I hope, I beg, I supplicate, that you will grant my other petition. Pray, pray, my lord, if you cannot pardon me, be merciful to the child I leave behind. What he will do when I am gone, I do not know, for I have been the only friend he has had ever since he was born. He was born, my lord, about sixteen years ago at anfield one summer a morning and carried by your cousin mr henry norwin to mr rymer's the curate there and i swore whose child he was before the dean and i did not take a false oath indeed indeed my lord i did not i will say no more for fear this should not come safe to your hand for the people treat me as if I were mad. So I will say no more, only this, that, whether I live or die, I forgive everybody, and I hope everybody will forgive me. And I pray that God will take pity on my son, if you refuse, but I hope you will not refuse. Agnes Primrose William rejoiced, as he laid down the petition, that she had asked a favor he could bestow, and hoped by his protection of the son to redress in some degree the wrongs he had done the mother. He instantly sent for the messenger in his apartment and impatiently asked if he had seen the boy and given proper directions for his care. I have given directions, sir, for his funeral. How? cried William. He pined away ever since his mother was confined, and died two days after her execution. Robbed by the news of his only gleam of consolation in the consciousness of having done a moral injury for which he never now by any means could alone, he saw all his honors, all his riches, all his proud selfish triumphs fade before him. They seemed like airy nothings, which in rapture he would exchange for the peace of a tranquil conscience. He envied Angus the death to which he first exposed, then condemned her. He envied her even the life she struggled through from his neglect, and felt that his future days would be far less happy than her former existence he calculated with precision end of chapter forty two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty three of nature and art this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c nature and art by elizabeth ichabald chapter forty three 
The progressive rise of William and fall of Agnes had now occupied nearly the term of eighteen years. Added to these, another year elapsed before the younger Henry completed the errand on which his heart was fixed and returned to England. Shipwreck, imprisonment, and other ills to which the poor and unfriended traveller is peculiarly exposed detained the father and son in various remote regions until the present period and for the last fifteen years denied them the means of all correspondence with their own country the elder henry was now past sixty years of age and the younger almost beyond the prime of life still length of time had not diminished but rather had increased their anxious longings for their native home the sorrows disappointments and fatigues which throughout these tedious years were endured by the two henrys are of that dull monotonous kind of suffering better omitted than described mere repetitious of the exile's woe that shall give place to the transporting joy of return from banishment yet often as the younger had reckoned with impatient wishes the hours which were passed distant from her he loved no sooner was his disastrous voyage at an end no sooner had his feet trod upon the shore of britain than a thousand wounding fears made him almost doubt whether it were happiness or misery he had obtained by his arrival if rebecca were living he knew it must be happiness for his heart dwelt with confidence on her faith her unchanging sentiments but death might possibly have ravished from his hopes what no mortal power could have done and thus the lover creates a rival in every ill rather than suffer his fears to remain inanimate the elder henry has less to fear or to hope than his son yet he both feared and hoped with a sensibility that gave him great anxiety he hoped his brother would receive him with kindness after his long absence and once more take his son cordially to his favour he longed impatiently to behold his brother to see his nephew nay in the ardour of the renewed affection he just now felt he thought even a distant view of lady clementia would be grateful to his sight but still well remembering the pomp the state the pride of william he could not rely on his affection so much he knew that it depended on external circumstances to excite or extinguish his love not that he feared an absolute repulsion from his brother but he feared what to a delicate mind is still worse reserved manners cold looks absent sentences and all that cruel retinue of indifference with which those who are beloved so often wound the bosom that adores them by inquiring of their countrymen whom they met as they approached to the end of their voyage concerning their relation the dean the two henrys learned that he was well and had for some years past been exalted to the bishopric of this news gave them joy while it increased their fear of not receiving an affectionate welcome the younger henry on his landing wrote immediately to his uncle acquainting him with his father's arrival in the most abject state of poverty he addressed his letter to the bishop's country residence where he knew as it was the summer season he would certainly be he and his father then set off on foot towards that residence a palace the bishop's palace was not situated above fifty miles from the port where they had landed and at a small inn about three miles from the bishop's they proposed as the letter to him intimidated 
to wait for his answer before they intruded into his presence as they walked on their solitary journey it was some small consolation that no creature knew them to be poor and ragged father the younger smilingly said is no disgrace no shame thank heaven where the object is not known true my son replied henry and perhaps i feel myself much happier now unknowing and unknown to all but you than i shall in the presence of my fortunate brother and his family for there confusion at my ill success through life may give me greater pain than even my misfortunes have inflicted after uttering this reflection which had preyed upon his mind he sat down on the roadside to rest his agitated limbs before he could proceed farther his son reasoned with him gave him courage and now his hopes preponderated till after two days journey on arriving at the inn where an answer from the bishop was expected no letter no message had been left he means to renounce us said henry trembling and whispering to his son without disclosing to the people of the house who they were or from whom the letter or the message they inquired for was to have come they retired and consulted what steps they were now to pursue previously to his writing to the bishop the younger henry's heart all his inclinations had swayed him towards a visit to the village in which was his uncle's former country seat the beloved village of anfield but respect to him and duty to his father had made him check those wishes now they revived again and with the image of rebecca before his eyes he warmly entreated his father to go with him to anfield at present only thirty miles distant and thence write once more then again wait the will of his uncle the father consented to this proposal even glad to postpone the visit to his dignified brother after a scanty repast such as they had been long inured to they quitted the inn and took the road towards anfield end of chapter forty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty four of nature and art this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c nature and art by elizabeth ichabald chapter forty four it was about five in the afternoon of a summer's day that henry and his son left the sign of the mermaids to pursue their third day's journey the young man's spirits elated with the prospect of the reception he should meet from rebecca the elder dejected at not having received a speedy welcome from his brother the road which led to anfield by the shortest course of necessity took our travellers within sight of the bishop's palace the turrets appeared at a distance and on the sudden turn round the corner of a large plantation the whole magnificent structure was at once exhibited before his brother's astonished eyes he was struck with the grandeur of the habitation and totally forgetting all the unkind the contemptuous treatment he had ever received from its owner like the same henry in his earlier years smiled with a kind of transport that william was so great a man after this first joyous sensation was over let us go a little nearer my son said he no one will see us i hope or if they should you can run and conceal yourself and not a creature will know me 
even my brother would not know me thus altered and i wish to take a little farther view of his fine house and all his pleasure grounds young henry though impatient to be gone would not object to his father's desire they walked forward between a shady grove and a purling rivulet snuffed in odors from the jessamine banks and listened to the melody of an adjoining aviary the allurements of the spot seemed to enchain the elder henry and he at length sauntered to the very avenue of the dwelling but just as he had set his daring yet trembling feet upon the turf which led to the palace gates he suddenly stopped on hearing as he thought the village clock strike seven which reminded him that evening drew on and it was time to go he listened again when he and his son both together said it is the toll of the bell before some funeral the signals of death while they humble the rich inspire the poor with pride the passing bell gave henry a momentary sense of equality and he courageously stepped forward to the first winding of the avenue he started back at the sight which presented itself a hearse mourning coaches mutes plumbed horses with every other token of the person's importance who was going to be committed to the earth scarcely had his terrified eyes thus unexpectedly struck when a coffin borne by six men issued from the gates and was deposited in the waiting receptacle while gentlemen in mourning went into the different coaches a standard-bearer now appeared with an ischion on which the keys and mitre were displayed young henry upon this pathetically exclaimed my uncle it is my uncle's funeral henry his father burst into tears the procession moved along the two henrys the only real mourners in the train followed at a little distance in rags but in tears the elder henry's heart was nearly bursting he longed to clasp the dear remains of his brother without the dread of being spurned for his presumption he now could no longer remember him either as the dean or bishop but leaping over the whole interval of pride and arrogance called only to his memory william such as he knew him when they lived at home together together walked to london and there together almost perished for want they arrived at the church and while the coffin was placing in the dreary vault the weeping brother crept slowly after to the hideous spot his reflections now fixed on a different point is this possible said he to himself is this the dean whom i ever feared is this the bishop of whom within the present hour i stood in awe is this william whose every glance struck me with his superiority alas my brother and is this horrid abode the reward for all your aspiring efforts are these sepulchral trappings the only testimonies of your greatness which you exhibit to me on my return did you foresee an end like this while you treated me and many more of your youthful companions with haughtiness and contempt while you thought it becoming of your dignity to shun and despise us where is the difference now between my departed wife and you or if there be a difference she perchance has the advantage ah my poor brother for distinction in the other world i trust some of your anxious labors have been employed for you are now of less importance in this than when you and i first left our native town and hope for nothing greater than to be suffered to exist on their quitting the church 
they inquired of the bystanders the immediate cause of the bishop's death and heard he had been suddenly carried off by a raging fever young henry inquired if lady clementina was at the palace or mr norry wynne the latter is there he was answered by a poor woman but lady clementina has been dead these four years dead dead cried young henry that worldly woman quitted this world for ever yes answered the stranger she caught cold by wearing a new fashioned dress that did not half cover her wasted all away and died the miserablest object you ever heard of the person who gave this melancholy intelligent concluded it with a hearty laugh which would have surprised the two hearers if they had not before observed that amongst all the village crowd that attended to see this solemn show not one afflicted countenance appeared not one dejected look not one watery eye the pastor was scarcely known to his flock it was in london that his meridian lay at the levee of ministers at the table of peers at the drawing-rooms of the great and now his neglected parishioners paid his indifference in kind the ceremony over and the morning sweet departed the spectators dispersed with gibbs and jeering faces from the sad spot while the henrys with heavy hearts retraced their steps back towards the palace in their way at the crossing of a stile they met a poor labourer returning from his day's work who looking earnestly at the throng of persons who were leaving the churchyard said to the older henry pray master what are all them folk gathered together about what's the matter there there has been a funeral replied henry oh zooks what a burying a eh? now i see it is and i warrant of our old bishop i heard he was main ill it is he they have been putting into the ground is it not yes said henry why then so much the better the better cried henry yes master though i should be loath to be where he is now henry started he was your pastor man ha 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 i should be sorry that my master's sheep that are feeding yonder should have no better pastor the fox would soon get them all you surely did not know him not much i can't say i did for he was above speaking to poor folks unless they did any mischief and then he was sure to take notice of them i believe he meant well said henry as to what he meant god only knows but i know what he did and what did he nothing at all for the poor if any of them applied to him no doubt oh they know better than all that comes to for if they asked for anything he was sure to have them sent to bridwell or the workhouse he used to say the workhouse was a fine place for a poor man the food good enough and enough of it yet he kept a dainty table himself his dogs too fared better than we poor he was vastly tender and good to all his horses and dogs i will say that for him and to all brute beasts he would not suffer them to be either starved or struck but he had no compassion for his fellow creatures i am sensible you do him wrong that he is the best judge of by this time he has sent many a poor man to the house of correction and now tis well if he has not got a place there himself ha 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 the man was walking away when henry called to him pray can you tell me if the bishop's son be at the palace oh yes 
you'll find master there treading in the old man's shoe a proud as lucifer has he any children no thank god there's been enow of the name and after the son is gone i hope we shall have no more of the breed is mrs norwyn the son's wife at the palace what master did you not know what's become of her an accident ha 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 yes i can't help laughing why master she made a mistake and went to another man's bed and so her husband and she were parted and she has married the other man indeed cried henry amazed ay indeed but if it had been my wife or yours the bishop would have made her do penance in a white sheet but as it was a lady why it was all very well and any one of us that had been known to talk about it would have been sent to bridwell straight but we did talk notwithstanding the malicious joy with which the peasant told this story made henry believe more than all the complaints the man uttered that there had been want of charity and christian deportment in the whole conduct of the bishop's family he almost wished himself back on his savage island where brotherly love could not be less than it appeared to be in this civilized country end of chapter forty four recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty five of nature and art this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c nature and art by elizabeth ichabald chapter forty five as henry and his son after parting from the poor laborer approached the late bishop's palace all the charms of its magnificence its situation which but a few hours before had captivated the elder henry's mind were vanished and from the mournful ceremony he had since been witness of he now viewed this noble edifice but as a heap of rubbish piled together to fascinate weak understandings and to make even the wise and religious man at times forget why he was sent into this world instead of presenting themselves to their nephew and cousin they both felt an unconquerable reluctance to enter under the superb the melancholy roof a bank a hedge a tree a hill seemed at this juncture a pleasanter shelter and each felt himself happy in being a harmless wanderer on the face of the earth rather than living in splendor while the wants the revelings of the hungry and the naked were crying to heaven for vengeance they gave a heartful sigh to the vanity of the rich and the powerful and pursued a path where they hoped to meet with virtue and happiness they arrived at anfield possessed by apprehensions which his uncle's funeral had served to increase young henry as he entered the well-known village feared every sound he heard would convey information of rebecca's death he saw the parsonage house at a distance but dreaded to approach it lest rebecca should no longer be an inhabitant his father indulged him in the wish to take a short survey of the village and rather learn by indirect means by observation his fate than hear it all at once from the lips of some blunt relater anfield had undergone great changes since henry left it he found some cottages built where formerly there were none and some were no more where he had frequently called and held short conversations with the poor who dwelt in them amongst the latter number 
was the house of the parents of agnes fallen to the ground he wondered to himself where that poor family had taken up their abode henry in a kinder world he once again cast a look at the old parsonage house his inquisitive eyes informed him there no alteration had taken place externally but he feared what change might be within at length he obtained the courage to enter the churchyard in his way to it as he slowly and trembling moved along he stopped to read here and there a gravestone as mild instructive conveyors of intelligence to which he could attend with more resignation than to any other reporter the second stone he came to he found was erected to the memory of the rev thomas rymer rebecca's father he instantly called to mind all that poor curate's quick sensibility of wrong towards himself his unbridled rage in consequence and smiled to think how trivial now appeared all for which he gave way to such excess of passion but shocked at the death of one so near to her he loved he now feared to read on and cast his eyes from the tombs accidentally to the church through the window of the chancel his sight was struck with a tall monument of large dimensions raised since his departure and adorned with the finest sculpture his curiosity was excited he drew near and could distinguish followed by elegant poetic praise to the memory of john lord viscount bentham notwithstanding the solemn melancholy anxious bent of henry's mind he could not read these words and behold this costly fabric without indulging a moment fit of indignant laughter are sculpture and poetry thus debased he cried to perpetrate the memory of a man whose best advantage is to be forgotten whose no one action merits record but as an example to be shunned an elderly woman leaning on her staff now passed along the lane by the side of the church the younger henry accosted her and ventured to inquire where the daughters of mr rymer since his death were gone to live we live she returned in that small cottage across the clover field henry looked again and thought he had mistaken the word we for he felt assured that he had no knowledge of the person to whom he spoke but she knew him and after a pause cried ah mr henry you are welcome back i am heartily glad to see you and my poor sister rebecca will go out of her wits with joy is rebecca living and will be glad to see me he eagerly asked while tears of rapture trickled down his face father he continued in his ecstasy we are now come home to be completely happy and i feel as all the years i have been away were but a short week and as if all the dangers i have passed had been light as air but it is possible he cried to his kind informer that you are one of rebecca's sisters well might he asked for instead of the blooming woman of seven-and-twenty he had left her her color was gone her teeth impaired her voice broken she was near fifty yes i am one of mr rymer's daughters she replied but which said henry the eldest and once called the prettiest she returned though now people tell me i am altered yet i cannot say i see it myself and are you all living henry inquired all but one she married and died the other three on my father's death agreed to live together and knit or spin for our support so we took that small cottage and furnished it with some of the parsonage furniture 
as you shall see and kindly welcome i am sure you will be to all it affords though it is but little as she was saying this she led him through the clover field towards the cottage his heart rebounded with joy that rebecca was there yet as he walked he shuddered at the impression which he feared the first sight of her would make he feared what had what he imagined till he had seen this change in her sister he should never heed he feared rebecca would look no longer young he was not yet so far master over his sensual propensities as when the trial came to think he could behold her look like her sister and not give some evidence of his disappointment his fears were vain on entering the gate of their little garden rebecca rushed from the house to meet them just the same rebecca as ever it was her mind which beaming on her face and actuating her every motion had ever constituted all her charms it was her mind which had gained her henry's affection that mind had undergone no change and she was the self-same woman he had left her he was entranced with joy End of chapter 45 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 46 of Nature and Art This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c nature and art by elizabeth ichabald chapter forty six the fare which the henrys partook at the cottage of the female rhymers was such as the sister had described mean and even scanty but this did not in the least diminish the happiness they received in meeting for the first time since their arrival in england human beings who were glad to see them at a stinted repast of milk and vegetables by the glimmering light of a little brushwood on the hearth they yet could feel themselves comparatively blessed while they listened to the recital of affections which had befallen persons around that very neighbourhood for whom every delicious viand had been procured to gratify the taste every art devised to delight the other senses it was by the side of this glimmering fire that rebecca and her sisters told the story of poor agnes's fate and of the thorn it had for ever planted in william's bosom of his reported sleeplessness perturbed nights and his gloomy or half-distracted days when in the fullness of remorse he had complained of a guilty conscience of the weariness attached to a continued prosperity the misery of wanting an object of affection they told of lord bentham's death from the effects of intemperance from a mass of blood infected by high seasoned dishes mixed with copious draughts of wine repletion of food and liquor not less fatal to the existence of the rich than the want of common sustenance to the lives of the poor they told of lady bentham's ruin since her lord's death by gaming they told that now she suffered beyond the pain of common indigence by the cutting triumph of those whom she had formerly despised they related what had been told before the divorce of william and the marriage of his wife with a libertine the decease of lady clementina occasioned by that incorrigible vanity which even old age could not subdue after numerous other examples had been recited of the dangers the evils that riches draw upon their owner 
the elder henry rose from his chair and embracing rebecca and his son said how much indebted are we to providence my children who while it inflicts poverty bestows peace of mind and in return for the trivial grief we meet in this world holds out our longing hopes the reward of the next not only resigned but happy in their station with hearts made cheerful rather than dejected by attentive meditation henry and his son planned the means of their future support independent of their kinsman william nor only of him but of every person and thing but their own industry well i have health and strength cried the old man and his son's looks acquiesced in all the father said i will not take from any one in affluence what only belongs to the widow the fatherless and the infirm for to such alone by christian laws however custom may subvert them the overplus of the rich is due End of chapter 46 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 47 of Nature and Art This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c nature and art by elizabeth ichabald chapter forty seven by forming a humble scheme for their remaining life a scheme depending upon their own exertions alone on no light promises of pretended friends and on no sanguine hopes of certain success but with prudent apprehension with fortitude against disappointment henry his son and rebecca now his daughter found themselves at the end of one year in the enjoyment of every comfort with such distinguished minds knew how to taste exempt both from patronage and from control healthy alive to every fruition with which nature blesses the world dead to all out of their power to attain the works of art susceptible of those passions with endear human creatures one to another insensible to those which separate man from man they found themselves the thankful inhabitants of a small house or hut placed on the borders of the sea each morning wakes the father and the son to cheerful labor in fishing or the tending of the garden the produce of which they carry to the next market town the evening sends them back to their home in joy where rebecca meets them at the door affectionately boasts of the warm meal that is ready and heightens the charm of conversation with her taste and judgment it was after a supper of roots from their garden poultry that rebecca's hand had reared and a jug brewed by young henry that the following discourse took place my son said the elder henry where under heaven shall three persons be met together happy as we three are it is the want of industry or the want of reflection which makes the poor dissatisfied labor gives a value to rest which the idle can never taste and reflection gives to the mind a degree of content which the unthinking never can know i once replied the younger henry considered poverty a curse but after my thoughts became enlarged and i had associated for years with the rich and now mixed with the poor my opinion has undergone a total change for i have seen and have enjoyed more real pleasure at work with my fellow laborers and in this cottage than ever i beheld or experienced during my abode at my uncle's during all my intercourse with the fashionable and the powerful of this world 
the worst is said rebecca the poor have not always enough who has enough asked her husband had my uncle no he hoped for more and in all his writings sacrificed his duty to his advice had his son enough when he yielded up his honour his domestic peace to gratify his ambition had lady benham enough when she staked all she had in the hope of becoming richer were we my rebecca of discontented minds we have now too little but conscious from observation and experience that the rich are not so happy as ourselves we rejoice in our lot the tear of joy which stole from her eye expressed more than his words a state of happiness he continued i remember when i first came a boy to england the poor excited my compassion but now that my judgment is matured i pity the rich i know that in this opulent kingdom there are nearly as many persons perishing through intemperance as starving with hunger there are as many miserable in the lassitude of having nothing to do as there are of those bowed down to the earth with hard labor there are more persons who draw upon themselves calamity by following their own will than there are who experience it by obeying the will of another add to this that the rich are so much afraid of dying they have no comfort in living there the poor have another advantage said rebecca for they may defy not only death but every loss by sea or land as they have nothing to lose besides added the elder henry there is certain joy of the most gratifying kind that the human mind is capable of tasting peculiar to the poor and of which the rich can but seldom experience the delight what can that be cried rebecca a kind word a benevolent smile one token of esteem from the person whom we consider as our superior to which rebecca replied and the rarity of obtaining such a token is what increases the honour certainly returned young henry and yet those in poverty ungrateful as they are murmur against that government from which they receive the blessing but this is the fault of education of early prejudice said the elder henry our children observe us pay respect even reverence to the wealthy while we slight or despise the poor the impression thus made on their minds in youth is indelible during the more advanced periods of life and they continue to pine after riches and lament under poverty nor is the seeming folly wholly destitute of reason for human beings are not yet so deeply sunk in voluptuous gratification or childish vanity as to place delight in any attainment which has not for its end the love or admiration of their fellow beings let the poor then cried the younger henry no more be their own persecutors no longer pay homage to wealth instantaneously the whole idolatrous worship will cease the idol will be broken end of chapter forty seven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c end of nature and art by elizabeth ichabald